Good evening and welcome to Separate Publishing Group. Tonight we're going to be presenting on the apocalypse of Baruch, Black and White Waters. We begin our reading in Baruch Sheni, or 2nd Baruch, chapter 53. And when I had said these things, I fell asleep there, and I saw a vision, and lo, a cloud was ascending from a very great sea. And I kept gazing upon it, and lo, it was full of waters, white and black. And there were many colors in those selfsame waters. And as it were, the likeness of great lightning was seen at its summit. And I saw the cloud passing swiftly in quick courses, and it covered all the earth. And it came to pass after these things that the cloud began to pour upon the earth, the waters that were in it. And I saw that there was not one and the same likeness in the waters which descended from it. For in the first beginning, they were black and many for a time. And afterwards, I saw that the waters became bright, but they were not many. And after these things again, I saw black waters. And after these things again, bright and again black and again bright. Now this was done 12 times, but the black were always more numerous than the bright. And it came to pass at the end of the cloud that lo, it rained black waters and they were darker than had been all those waters that were before and fire was mingled with them. And where those waters descended, they wrought devastation and destruction. Nevertheless, because you have besought El Elyon to reveal to you the interpretation of the vision which you have seen, I have been sent to tell you, and El Elohim has assuredly made known to you the methods of the times that have passed, and of those that are destined to pass in his world from the beginning of its creation, even unto its consummation, of those things which are deceit and of those things which are in truth. For as you did see a great cloud which ascended from the sea and went and covered the earth, this is the duration of the world which El Elohim made when he took counsel to make the world. And it came to pass when the word had gone forth from his presence that the duration of the world had come into being in a small degree and was established according to the multitude of the intelligence, and intelligence of him who sent it. And as you did previously see on the summit of the cloud black waters, which descended previously on the earth, this is the transgression wherewith Adam, the first man, transgressed. For since when he transgressed, untimely death came into being, grief was named, and anguish was prepared, and pain was created, and trouble consummated, and disease began to be established, and Sheol kept demanding that it should be renewed in blood, and the begetting of children was brought about, and the passion of parents produced. And the greatness of man was humiliated, goodness languished. What therefore can be blacker or darker than these things? This is the beginning of the black waters which you have seen, and from these black waters again were black derived, and the darkness of darkness was produced. For he became a danger to his own soul, even to the angels, he became a danger. For moreover, at that time, when he was created, they enjoyed liberty. And some of them descended and mingled with the women. And then those who did so were tormented in chains. But the rest of the multitude of the angels, of which there is no number, restrained themselves. And those who dwelt on the earth perished together with them through the waters of the deluge. 
These are the black first waters. And after these waters, you did see bright waters. This is the fount of Abraham, also his generations, and advent of his son, and of his son's son, and of those like them. Because at that time, the unwritten Torah was named amongst them, and the works of the commandments were then fulfilled. And belief in the coming judgment was then generated, and hope of the world that was to be renewed was then built up, and the promise of the life that should come hereafter was implanted. These are the bright waters which you have seen. And the black third waters which you have seen, these are the mingling of all sins which the nations afterwards wrought after the death of those righteous men and the wickedness of the land of Mitzrayim, wherein they did wickedly in the service wherewith they made their sons to serve. Nevertheless, these also perished at last. And the bright fourth waters which you have seen are the advent of Moshe and Aharon and Miriam and Yahusha, the son of Nun, and Caleb, and of all those like them. For at that time, the lamp of the eternal Torah shone on all those who sat in darkness, which announced to them that believe the promise of their reward, and to them that deny the torment of fire, which is reserved for them. But also the heavens at that time were shaken from their place, and those who were under the throne of El Elohim were perturbed when he was taking Moshe unto himself, for he showed him many admonitions together with the principles of the Torah and the consummation of the times. As also to you, and likewise, the pattern of Zion and its measures, in the pattern of which the sanctuary of the present time was to be made. And the black fifth waters which you have seen raining are the works which the Emerim wrought, and the spells of their incantations which they wrought, and the wickedness of their mysteries, and the mingling of their pollution. But even Yasharel was then polluted by sins in the days of the judges, though they saw many signs which were from him who made them. And the bright sixth waters, which you did see, this is the time in which David and Shalomah were born. And there was at that time the building of Zion and the dedication of the sanctuary and the shedding of much blood of the nations that sinned then and many offerings, which were offered then in the dedication of the sanctuary. And peace and tranquility existed at that time and wisdom was heard in the assembly, and the riches of understanding were magnified in the assemblies, and the holy feasts were fulfilled in blessedness and in much joy, and the judgment of the rulers was then seen to be without guile, and the righteousness of the precepts of El Elohim was accomplished with truth. And the black seventh waters which you have seen. This is the perversion brought about by the council of Yerobam, who took counsel to make two calves of gold. And all the iniquities which kings who were after him iniquitously wrought. And the curse of Jezebel and the worship of idols, which Yasharel practiced at that time and the withholding of rain and the famines which occurred until women ate the fruit of their wombs, and the time of their captivity, which came upon the nine tribes and half, because they were in many sins. And Shalmaneser, king of Ashur, came and led them away captive. And the bright eighth waters, which you have seen, 
This is the rectitude and uprightness of Yekiskiyahu, king of Yehuda, and the grace of Elohim which came upon him. For when Sankarev was stirred up in order that he might perish, and his wrath troubled him in order that he might thereby perish, for the multitude also of the nations which were with him. When, moreover, Yekiskiyahu the king heard those things, which the king of Ashur was devising, that he was coming to seize him and destroy his people. The two and a half tribes which remained, nay, more he wished to overthrow Zion also. Then Yekiskiyahu trusted in his works and had hope in his righteousness and spoke with El Elohim. And Zion was saved and Yerushalayim delivered. Yasharel also was freed from tribulation, and all those who were in the Holy Land rejoiced, and the name of El Elohim was glorified, so that it was spoken of. These are the bright waters which you have seen. And the black knife waters which you have seen. This is all the wickedness which was in the days of Manasseh, the son of Yekiskiyahu, for he wrought much impiety, and he slew the righteous, and he perverted judgment, and he shed the blood of the innocent, and wedded women he violently polluted, and he overturned the altars, and destroyed their offerings, and drove forth their priests lest they should minister in the sanctuary. And he made an image with five faces. Four of them looked to the four winds, and the fifth on the summit of the image as an adversary of the zeal of El Elohim. And then wrath went forth from the presence of El Elohim to the intent that Zion should be rooted out, as also it befell in your days. But also against the two tribes and a half went forth a decree that they should also be led away captive, as you have now seen. And to such degree did the impiety of Manasseh increase that it removed the praise of El Elyon from the sanctuary. On this account, Manasseh was at that time named the impious, and finally his abode was in the fire. For though his prayer was heard with El Elyon, finally, when he was cast into the brazen horse and the brazen horse was melted, it served as a sign unto him for the hour. For he had not lived perfectly, for he was not worthy, but that thenceforward he might know by whom finally he should be tormented. For he who is able to benefit is also able to torment. Thus, moreover, did Manasseh act impiously and thought that in his time, El Elohim would not inquire into things. These are the black ninth waters which you have seen. And the bright tenth waters which you have seen. This is the purity of the generations of Yoshayahu, king of Yehuda, who was the only one at that time who submitted himself to El Elohim with all his heart and with all his soul. And he cleansed the land from idols and sanctified all the vessels which had been polluted. And he restored the offerings to the altar and raised the horn of the holy and exalted the righteous and honored all that were wise in understanding and brought back the priests to their ministry and destroyed and removed the magicians and the enchanters and the necromancers from the land. And not only did he slay the impious that were living, but they also took from the sepulchers the bones of the dead and burned them with fire. And the feasts and the Shabbats he established in their sanctity. And their polluted ones he burnt in the fire, and the lying prophets which deceived the people. 
These also he burnt in the fire. And the people who listened to them when they were living, he cast them into the brook Kidron and heaped stones upon them. And the black 11th waters, which you have seen, this is the calamity which is now befalling Zion. Do you think that there is no anguish to the angels in the presence of El Elohim, that Zion was so delivered up, and that, lo, the other nations boast in their hearts and assemble before their idols and say, she is trodden down, who oft times trod down, and she has been reduced to servitude that reduced others. Do you think that in these things El Elyon rejoices, or that his name is glorified? But how will it serve towards his righteous judgment? Yet after these things, shall the dispersed among the other nations be taken hold of by tribulation, and in shame shall they dwell in every place. Because so far as Zion is delivered up, and Jerusalem laid waste, shall idols prosper in the cities of other nations and the vapor of the smoke of the incense of the righteousness, which is by the Torah, is extinguished in Zion. And in the region of Zion, in every place low, there is the smoke of impiety. But the king of Babel will arise, who has now destroyed Zion, and he will boast over the people, and he will speak great things in his heart in the presence of El Elyon but he also shall fall at last. These are the black waters. And the bright 12th waters, which you have seen, this is the word. For after these things, a time will come when your people shall fall into distress so that they shall all run the risk and perish together. Nevertheless, they will be saved and their enemies will fall in their presence, and they will have in due time much joy. And at that time, after a little interval, Zion will again be built, and its offerings will again be restored, and the priests will return to their ministry, and also the other nations will come to glorify it. Nevertheless, not fully as in the beginning, but it will come to pass after these things that there will be the fall of many nations. These are the bright waters which you have seen. So, brothers and sisters, we talk now about this prophecy of Baruch and how he has summarized those events which led to the destruction of Israel. And when we speak of these things, let us speak now of let us speak now of the immensity of this prophecy because remember that these were the people called by his name these were the people who had been placed into the promised land at the hand of yah these are the people they were called by his name, chosen, selected, set aside. And their falling away was significant. And we see that their falling away began with wicked rulers, namely Manasseh. Manasseh was a very wicked, wicked king who ruled for 55 years. He is the one who had Isaiah, Yeshayahu, sawed in half with a wooden saw, hanging him from his feet to do so. Is it a surprise that you would see Manasseh burned in the brazen horse? Notwithstanding the fact that he repented at the end of his life with the prayer of Manasseh, which is found in the Sefer. He repented at the end of his life, saying, oh, we know that you are merciful. Your mercy endures forever. 
So forgive my iniquity, but his iniquity was not forgiven. As Shimon Baruch tells us, Baruch saying, he will learn that he who has benefited is also he who can torment. Now, this is a very good point that Lily makes. The black waters from the eyes of the nations are bright waters for the ones chosen for salvation. Now, this is so true. And we see that even the dispersion of the, of the tribes of Yasharel, this dispersion would be necessary. Because in this dispersion, so the tribes would be pushed out to the ends of the earth. And in that place, the tribes would grow and thrive. And some of the tribes would move to a place where they could practice the Torah that they had not kept when they were in the land. And so we can see that the struggle that was at one time handed to Yasharel on a silver platter, I will set you in a land of milk and honey and a promise, a promised land. I will be your Elohim. You will be my children. Hear my voice. And under those circumstances, I will bless you. I will bless you coming in and going out. I will bless you in the city. I will bless you in the field. I will bless your children. I will bless the fruit of your crops and your fields. All of these things would be blessed. And so here we see the blessing promised. And yet the blessing was rebuked in favor of arrogance, in favor of the promotion of flesh, in favor of the advancement of incantation and sorcery, and all of these things. Now, some of us may ask the question, how can Yasharel be so foolish as to do this? And now we look at our own country and ask ourselves, how can we stop doing what we're doing right now? How do we get our leaders to stop doing what they're doing? It seems very difficult, but we see that Yah intends to deliver his people. Yah intends to place his people in a safe spot, in a safe land to cover them, to bless them, to set them in a wilderness, to set them apart, and to provide them a hidden manna. Such it is that the promises are found in the Apocalypse of Baruch. They're also found in the Apocalypse of Hanok. And they will be found also in the Apocalypse of Ezra as we look at that next week. So I want to thank you guys for joining me here. So if there are any questions here now, this is the opportunity to ask us some questions before we conclude our presentation today. Any questions, uh, please set them forth in the chat and I will try to follow them as best I can and answer those as best I can. I know that um, uh, we are talking about now, of course, we're down to the counting of the Omer. I believe we're down to day 32 in the counting of the Omer. So we are closing in on Shavuot, Shavuot which is coming up in just a few weeks. And I want to encourage you to come among one another that you might find a, a place to celebrate Shavuot together with your two uh, fine loaves of leavened bread. Okay. All right. So let's see. Okay. Question time. Okay. So Jessica is saying it's question time. So if you guys have got a question, please post it in the chat. And if we don't have questions, then I'll have to ask a few questions of my own. I'm going to start with this. When we talk about Baruch, you know, Shimon Baruch was the scribe of Yermiyahu, Jeremiah. And according to the Irish Chronicles, he traveled with Jeremiah into Ireland. And he was known in Ireland as Simon Brug. Brug. We can see that that would be a kind of common pronunciation of the name Baruch, Baruch, Baruch. So Brug in the Irish, Baruch. And so when we see this, uh, we know that the information that is given to us 
by the uh, hieroglyphs provided in Ireland makes it pretty clear that Baruch and Yirmiyahu would re-arrive in Ireland to re-establish Jerusalem anew, replant Jerusalem. Now, the, the replanting of Jerusalem is not over. There's going to be another, yet another replanting. So Lily writes and says, thinking about the coronation after the teaching that we did the other day on eating wild honey and locusts, could there be a tree? Could that be the tree Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream? Well, it's possible that tree you're talking about is a common representation in the Christian churches in Britain, which is a depiction of the tree of life. But you have to remember that the yeah the tree that is in Daniel 4.11 is actually the tree of Babylon. <clears throat> and if you look at that prophecy, and you look at it closely with a, with a careful calculation, you will discover that Babylon was cut down. And in fact, you can date the date that um, Nebuchadnezzar was cast into the wilderness for seven years. And from that date, you come forward, the dating that is there, and it takes you to 1946, when the iron band that is wrapped around Babylon would come off around that tree, and that tree would begin to grow again. And that kingdom would be restored, that Babylon would be restored. And it's an exact dating with the creation of the United Nations. I'll try to show that maybe next week we can get into that and take a look. That the tree that is seen that Nebuchadnezzar sees is Babylon. And that nation is cut down and is restored in the end times. And we see now that the United Nations is becoming uh, one of the most, one of the greatest leaders of wickedness in the world. The United Nations uh, trying to decriminalize pedophilia as we speak. The United Nations promoting the World Health Organization. And so on. So it's, we'll, we'll talk about this when we get into the prophecies of Daniel. Okay, and Joy asked the question, will our president, in your opinion, ever be tried for treason? Uh, and the answer is, Joy, no, I don't think so. I think that the entire establishment of the United States is completely co-opted. And because it's completely co-opted, the Central Intelligence Agency is com in complete control of the federal government. And they're not going to allow any president to be tried for treason. Instead, what is going to happen is going to be a conflagration, a giant fire, which will bring justice to the United States. And that fire is coming quickly. And it's an unfortunate thing, because as we can see, when you have a wicked leader like Menasha, you have a leader that does not understand uh, how bad the situation is until he's on his deathbed. But the situation of Menashe was so bad that Yah cast his judgment on Yehud. And it was a permanent judgment saying to Yekon Yahu, the son of Yoshi Yahu, the grandson of Menashe, you will not sit on the throne of David and none of your sons will sit on the throne of David. You may sit, you may, there, there will always be kings in the line of David, but they will never sit on the throne in Yehud again. This was a great dispersion. And when you talk about the dispersion of the Northern Kingdom, they were taken away naked with leashes around their neck. There, this fate is going to be very similar for America because we have not thrown off our wicked leadership. We have not managed to muster the, the uh, ideas, the concepts, the intelligence, or the will to throw off our wicked leaders. And as a consequence, a very similar judgment is coming to America. A quick read of Deuteronomy 28, beginning at verse 15, will give you an idea of exactly what's coming here. Even the prophecies beginning in Isaiah 9-11, these prophecies going all the way through the end of Isaiah 9 and going all the way into Isaiah 10 are all coming upon the United States. Okay. Have you seen the Dead Sea Scroll calendar? It's on Ken Johnson. Well, overbuilt automotive. I'm not sure how you overbuilt it, but I, looking at your picture, it looks like a pretty neat car. Uh, 
yeah, their calendar, the calendar issue is, you know, wide open. I've seen virtually every calendar you can imagine from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar, to the Zadok calendar, to the Hanok calendar, to the Soli Lunar calendar, to the Sumerian calendar, to the Colini calendar. Uh, Ken Johnson, I'm sure he's got a well-established persuasive approach to delivering his understanding of the calendar. I think that's great. Let's see. Oh yeah, no, no, overbuilt automotive, it's okay, it's all right. I can handle the questions that are that are off topic, let's see. But I have a question for you, Overbuilt Automotive. Are you building Chevys or Dodges? That's the big question. All right. All right. Let's see what else we have. Let's see. Chapter 63 enlightens the judgment to come of kings. Are we not his living stones, kings too? Well, this is true. This is true, Ron. We are kings and priests, but the meaning of the kings and priests in the New Testament, a king is someone who is sovereign over his own thoughts. This is a very important part. King is sovereign over his own thoughts. What does this mean to be a king in Yahweh's kingdom? It means to be completely in control of your own thinking. You don't say, my pastor told me, or I watched it on a video and now I understand. You have to have the conviction in your own mind, predicated upon your own study, as to the assertions that come out of your mouth. This is called intellectual integrity and mental definition that you can defend your own point of view, not reiterating the point of view of, let's say, a newscaster on CNN or something like this, but rather to hold your own view and to articulate your logic for holding that view back to its core concepts. Okay. Let's see. Uh, what else do we have here? Okay. In the time of bright waters, keep the faith. Yeah, we are in the time of bright waters. And it is good for us to be in a time of bright waters, Lily, because we are seeing that Yah's hand is moving on the world, and he is cleaning up the wickedness, and it's because there is so much wickedness, there is going to take a lot of cleaning. And if you recall, the wickedness at the time of Noah was so bad, he had to flood the whole earth. A similar judgment is coming upon the earth now that's going to be a worldwide judgment. So keep this. All right, let's see. Joseph Reynolds says, I've been going through a rough time, needs prayer. My whole family abandoned me in 2004. It's praying quite hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can tell you, Joseph, that, you know, if you can get over to the Telegram channels that are talked about in the, in the uh, caption beneath this video, you'll find some places of fellowship. Okay. All right. Let's see. You recognize you take part in the second Passover versus the first. Yes, Debbie, I do take part in the second Passover. The second Passover is for those that are unclean or on a journey far away. And of course, we're not in Yerushalayim, so therefore the second Passover is appropriate. And I don't take it versus the first because I also practice the first Passover. So um, yeah, the first and second Passover. And I have to tell you that Passover was absolutely wonderful this year. It was wonderful. We were in South Africa and we had a spontaneous Passover and uh, it was outstanding. It was very, very good. So how do you celebrate a Shavuot? Well, Shavuot is actually when the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. And Shavuot is done with the recognition of the Shabbat. It's a Shabbat, that is to say, to do no servile work. And it's also to be celebrated with two loaves of leavened bread, because you are celebrating the initial wheat harvest. And so as a consequence, all of the food in your storage shed goes out and you begin to eat fresh, you begin to eat anew, okay? All right, let's see. When you comment on the book of the Netzarim, okay, now, yeah, I, you know, I think Adam has done a great job in restoring this book. This book, however, is what you would call, what I would call Essene literature. And so the Essene literature is, uh, I mean, it's, it's a great read. But it is the kind of thing that would not be included in the New Testament, okay? So I'm going to leave it at that. And I know that Adam has been, been doing a great job in exposing this book and blessings to him for doing it, okay? So Blackie Mahoney asks, how do we know Baruch is inspired? Well, now, this is a great question, Blackie. One question that I have is, how do we know that any book in Scripture is inspired? 
what's the criteria? And when we articulate that criteria, now apply it to the book of Philemon in the New Testament. You know, this it's a very difficult question when you're talking about how do we know that a book is quote unquote inspired. You know, when we talk about this inspired work, it seems to me that when you have thus saith Yahweh or El Elohim said, that that is enough to warrant inspiration, assuming that it's not, not uh, nothing is found false inside it. However, that's not the criteria that was used by the Catholic Church when they initially determined what was going to be in the New Testament. The determination of what was going to be in the New Testament was determined based upon what the church in Antioch was using for a New Testament. That was it. What are they doing in Antioch? Oh, they're using these. Great. That's what our New Testament is. There was discussion about, gee, we should add the Shepherd of Hermas, the three books of the Shepherd of Hermas. We should add the Epistle of Barnabas. We should add the Gospel of Nicodemus. We should add the Gospel of Mary. We should add the Epoch of the Vision of Paul. We should add the Vision of Paul. Can we get that? Answer is no. And the answer became no because that isn't what Antioch used. So when we talk about inspired work, this is a good question for you. Now. So I'm going to put the I'm going to put the impetus back on you, put it back on your table, and say, show me what the accepted criteria is for an inspired work. I'm interested in seeing it. Okay. Overbuilt Automotive says Chevy or Dodges of four, 460 for my 1977 rollback tow truck. Yeah, 460. Yeah, yeah. And a 1984 Toyota Supra. Hey, what are you doing on the Supra? I, you know, a small turbo? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, automatic slush box point. Oh, yeah, for sure. You got to put a stick transmission in it. You know, and the thing is, those Toyota Supras, if I recall, that had a straight six 24 valve overhead cam system in it. If you dual turbo that baby, you're going to be rocking and rolling on that thing. Okay. Let's see. Um, let's see what we got. Uh, Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision, but the day of Yahweh is near in the Valley of Decision. Isn't that the truth, Yoko? That is the truth. The day of decision is near. It is near. And people are going to part in that valley. Now, what are they going to do? Okay. Shabbat, the 15th of the third month, is always the first day of the 12th week. That is shorted, and today is the fifth day of the ninth week. Okay, that is according to a specific kind of calendar. It doesn't necessarily agree with my calendar, but I'm sure it agrees with yours. Okay, uh, for what reason would they burn their bones even though they were killed? Well, isn't that a great question? Thank you for bringing this up, Melissa, because that's a great question. You know, this happened to uh, our friend. Uh, let's see if I can remember his name now. Uh, he was one of the... Um, uh, Wycliffe, he was one of the early writers in English, and Wycliffe succeeded in living out his life, and then the Roman church went back in and dug up his grave, burned his bones, and scattered them on the water. Now, this is something that we all need to think about. We've had long discussions about this in Shabbat, whether or not it is appropriate for the believer to be cremated, because here in Baruch, we see that burning their bones was a methodology that they believed would deprive them of the restoration of their bones in the second coming or at the time of the resurrection. Something to think about. We've had back and forth on this, and many people have just walked away with the conviction, well, I'm going to be buried, well, I'm going to be cremated. But it's something to think about as we look in the scriptures. Here we have an you know, obvious testimony that at the time of Baruch, burning the bones was considered of uh, casting them away into eternal darkness. Okay. So Lily writes, do you think Pentecost, as we think about it, when the believers were speaking in tongues languages, actually occurred after the next 50 days of the Feast of New Wine, hence the accusation the believers were drunk? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think there was plenty of wine to go around, and when they started, when they started talking in tongues, they just assumed that was the case. Okay. Um, Let's see, inspired, book that inspired, you. inspired books are those that inspire you to follow Yah. There we go. Thank you, Cindy. That's a great answer. Uh, should we all still be offering the sacrifice lamb as peace offerings to be compliant to the feasts? That's a good question, Blackie. And the answer is no. The, the sacrifice of an animal was something that Moshe gave 
Yah did not give. And Yah told Abraham, Yah would provide himself a lamb. And so the, the blood sacrifice of Mashiach was the last blood sacrifice that ever needs to be made. Now, if you're going to eat lamb on Pesach, don't sacrifice it for the feast. The sacrifice that we do now is done with prayer and making yourself a living sacrifice. Okay, all right. So this week is the order of Gamul reward on my calendar, Sean. Okay, all right. All right, Sean. Well, I mentioned it for you there. Do I consider Jubilees to be an inspired book? Yes. And it's not just me who considers Jubilees to be an inspired book. The Ethiopian Church, the Eritrean Church, the Assyriac Church considered it to be an inspired book. And the Keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls considered it to be so inspired, they had more copies of Jubilees than they did of the Torah. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. Okay. All right. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. All right, now with that, we're going to stop talking about cars for a while, even though I think it's a good discussion. And we can all dream about, you know, about this new Dodge that they're putting out that's like 1,200 horsepower, the most powerful car that they've ever unleashed off the show. But that's another story, and it's going to have to wait for a different presentation. So I want to thank you. Okay, let's see. Tornadoes are going on again. Yes. Yah's judgment, remember mercy for all. Yes. And remember what it says in Scripture. It rains on the just and the unjust. Okay. So such is the way in the world, but let us pray together, okay? Let us pray together now for each other and for this fellowship. Heavenly Father, we come together to lift up our hands and to lift up our voices, to lift up your name upon us, that we might be covered in your name and called by your name. For you are our Elohim, you are our deliverer, our sanctifier, our strong tower, our mighty fortress. May your wings surround the brothers and sisters now, Father, to keep us from all calamity. May you disperse our enemies to the four corners of the earth, Father, and confuse those who seek to attack us. Give them mental debilitation that they are unable to lift one finger against your children. May the house of Israel, the house of Yashorel, be blessed in your name, Father, and those who sojourn with us who say to you, Yahweh, you are Elohim, we are your children. You have blessed us in the blood of Yahushua HaMashiach, the Lamb whose atonement reconciled us to your kingdom. We give thanks that you have called us into your family, Father, that you have set us among your people. We pray that we would be of service to you as you call us, that we would be strong in the ways that you have asked us to act, that our faith would be strong and powerful to walk us through the adversity that comes upon the earth, and that at all times we would bless your name. Baruch atah, Yahweh Elochai Yasharel Avinu Olam La Olam. Blessed are you, Yahweh, the Elohim of Yasharel, our Father, forever and ever. In the name of Yahusha HaMashiach, our Mashiach, and our atonement whose resurrection and ascension has brought us to you, Father, as a sweet incense before your throne. We lift this prayer now. Aman, aman, and hallelujah. Okay, thank you all, and we will see you again next week. <laughs>